Welcome to a visual guide to Mixture of Experts. My name is Maarten and today we are going through an amazing technique used in the realm of large language models. Mixture of Experts, or MO, is a technique that uses different submodels or experts to improve the quality of large language models. Two main components define a MO. The first are experts, and these experts are feed-forward neural networks, and at least one can be activated. The router or the gate network determines which tokens are sent to which experts. In each layer of an LLM with a MO, we find somewhat specialized experts. But know that an expert is not specialized in a specific domain like psychology or biology, and at most it learns syntactic information on a token level instead. The router or gate network selects the experts that are best suited for a given input. And to explore what experts represent and how they work, let us first examine what MO is supposed to replace, the dense layers. Remember that a standard decoder-only transformer architecture has the feed-forward neural network applied after layer normalization. The feed-forward neural network uses the contextual information created by attention to capture complex relationships in the data. The feed-forward neural network in a decoder-only model is called a dense model since all parameters are activated. Looking at the dense model, notice how the input activates all parameters at least to some degree. We can chop up our dense model into pieces, the so-called experts, retrain it and only activate a subset of experts at a given time. This is called a sparse model and during inference only specific experts are used. When asked a question, we can select the best expert for a given task. In practice, experts are typically whole feed-forward neural networks themselves, and not just pieces of a hidden layer. A given text will pass through multiple experts before the output is generated. The chosen experts likely differ between tokens, which results in different paths being taken. Each new token may result in a different path and may activate a different set of experts. This means that each time you run inference, a set of experts is chosen that are best suited for the input. If we update our visualization of the dense decoder with multiple feedforward neural networks, it would now be called a sparse decoder, thereby capturing the first part of MO, which are the experts. But there's still a piece of the puzzle missing. How do you choose which experts to use? Well, that's where the router comes in, and it helps us decide which expert is best suited for a given input. The router, together with the experts, make up the MO layer in a sparse decoder and replace the single feed-forward neural network. We can zoom in on the MO layer and explore how this router works in detail. After the feed-forward neural network in the router, we see a softmax function creating probabilities for each expert that are used to select and activate the best expert. The final output is generated by multiplying the router probability with the expert output, creating a weighted activation. This entire architecture is therefore nothing more than multiple feed-forward neural networks and a router selecting the best or best experts. A given mode layer comes in two sizes, either a dense or a sparse mixture of experts. A dense mixture of experts will distribute the tokens across all experts, whereas a sparse MO will only select a few experts. When we have multiple experts selected, their weighted outputs get aggregated. Let's explore how data flows through the MO layer. In its most basic form, we multiply the input X by a router weight matrix W to create the output of the router, which we call h of x. Then the softmax of the output is taken to create probabilities, g of x, one for each expert. 
the router uses this probability distribution to choose the best matching expert. We then take the output per selected expert and multiply that with the router probabilities. We do this for every expert selected. Since we chose only one expert, we are only doing this calculation once. This creates our output, one vector for each expert. And that is how a typical Mo layer processes the data. And it seems straightforward, right? Well, there's one big disadvantage. During training, some experts might learn faster and more than others. As a result, the same set of experts might be chosen too frequently regardless of the input. Instead, we want equal importance among experts during training and inference. We call this load balancing, and it's to prevent overfitting on the same experts. To explore advancements in load balancing, let's look at how we can improve the Mo layer with a method called KeepTopK. Remember that in the first step, we multiply the input with the router weights to create the output, h of x, of the router. With keep top k, we introduce trainable Gaussian noise, which helps us prevent the same experts from always being chosen. By introducing noise, some experts might accidentally get lower scores, thereby giving more opportunity for other experts to train. Then, sparsity is introduced by setting the weights of all but the top two experts to minus infinity. And when we process this updated output with a softmax function, the output will result in a probability of zero of all the values that were set to minus infinity. Therefore, it sets the probabilities of all but the top two experts to zero. Combined, they allow undertrained experts to catch up to experts that were chosen more frequently and therefore had more opportunity to train. Routing tokens to a few selected experts is also called token choice and allows for a given token to be sent to either one expert, and that's called top one routing, or to more than one expert. We call this top K routing, K for how many experts you select. To further improve load balancing, we can add auxiliary lo loss, which is also called load balancing loss, to the network's regular loss. Imagine that for each input token, we have router probabilities that route the tokens to the experts. The first component of this auxiliary loss is to sum the router values per expert. This gives us the important score per expert, which represents how likely an expert will be chosen. How equal the distribution of important scores is can be calculated with the coefficient variation, which is simply the standard deviation divided by the mean of these important scores. If there are a lot of differences in important scores, the CV will be high. If all experts have similar important scores, the CV will be low. Auxiliary loss is the CV multiplied by W, a constant scaling factor. The auxiliary loss is updated during training such that it aims to lower the CV as much as possible, thereby creating more equal importance among the experts. The auxiliary loss is added as a separate loss to optimize during training. And this additional loss therefore results in a more stable training procedure where all experts are given somewhat equal chance to train. Imbalance, however, is not just found in the experts that were chosen, but also in the distributions of tokens that are sent to the expert. Note that expert 4 has received only one token of the input, whereas expert 1 has received all other tokens. As a result, compared to expert 1, Expert 4 ends up undertrained since it receives so few tokens during training. To prevent this problem, 
we limit how many tokens they can process, which we call the expert capacity. By setting the expert to capacity to three, this expert can only process three tokens. Tokens that exceed this threshold are routed to the next most likely expert, in this case, expert four. If both experts have reached capacity, any new token will not be processed by any expert, but instead sent to the next layer. This is referred to as token overflow. And therefore, it is important that we find a balance between the number of tokens an expert can process and how many will be left unprocessed. A big part of what makes Mo interesting is its computational requirements. Since only a subset of experts are used at a given time, we have access to more parameters than we're actually using. Although a given Mo has more parameters to load, which we call the sparse parameters, fewer are activated since we only use some experts during inference, and we call these the active parameters. In other words, we still need to load the entire model onto your device, these are the sparse parameters, but when we run inference, we only need to use a subset. We call these the active parameters. Let's explore the number of sparse versus active parameters with an example, mixtrol 8 times 7 b And this model is an amazing large language model that uses Mo layers. And its name suggests that it uses eight experts, each with a size of 7 billion parameters. And let's see whether that is actually true. First, the embeddings make up for a relatively small part of the model with 131 million parameters. These are shared parameters and are used regardless of whether we load or use the model. Second are the parameters for the attention mechanism, which is a big chunk of the entire model with more than 1 billion parameters. The router has a set number of parameters per expert and it's actually quite small with only 32,000 parameters. Fourth are the experts. Although four experts are shown in this image, the model actually has eight experts to choose from. Each expert actually has 5.6 billion parameters and not the suggested 7 billion. Most likely the reason why they mentioned 7 billion parameters is because they counted all other parameters. But more on that later. The total parameters of all experts is 45 billion, but since the model only ag activates two experts at a time, the active parameters are only 11 billion. Finally, the head of the model also has a small number of parameters that are shared, similar to the embeddings with 131 million parameters. So the total number of parameters of the model is more than eight experts. Looking at all parameters, we can see that the model has 47 billion parameters when loaded. During inference, it only needs to activate roughly 13 billion parameters, making it much faster than its size would suggest. And this is one of the main advantages of Mo. Although its size is large, inference is much faster. Now that we have explored the basics of mixture of experts in large language models, we can do the same for vision models. To explore Mo in vision models, let's recap the vision transformer first. The input of a text-based transformer are sequences that are split up into tokens. To perform the same tokenization process with images, we instead convert them into patches, and we can also call these tokens. To further process these patches, we flatten them into a sequence of patches. This sequence is passed to a linear projection to create embeddings, one for each patch. The CLS token or the classification token is added along with positional embeddings before being passed to the encoder. The encoder in the vision transformer is no different from an encoder that processes text. To use Mo, we then only need to replace the feedforward neural network with a Mo layer that has the same characteristics 
that we've seen thus far. And this is called a vision mo. Note how we can leverage the existing architecture of transformers to implement mo in a vision model. Since images generally have many patches, a low expert capacity is used for each expert to reduce hardware constraints. However, a low capacity tends to lead to patches being dropped, and this is akin to token overflow. To keep the capacity low, a priority score assigns important scores to patches, so that the most important patches are processed first. This results in a much more accurate representation of the original image. As a result, we should still see important patches routed if the percentage of tokens decreases. However, Vision Mo still needs to drop tokens, so information is lost. Instead, let's look at an alternative, namely Soft Mo. In Vision Mo, the priority score helps differentiate between less important patches and more important patches. However, a subset of patches are assigned to each expert, and information in unprocessed patches is lost. Softmo solves this problem and aims to go from a discrete patch assignment to a soft patch assignment by mixing patches. In practice, all patches are used instead of only a subset to create the soft patch. We weigh each patch using the priority score and then take a linear combination of these weighted patches before we send the soft patch to the chosen expert. To create these soft patches, soft mode takes the input X patch embeddings for each patch with dimensions D, so the size of the input vector, by M, the number of patches. X is then multiplied by a learnable matrix phi with dimensions D by the capacity for each expert. This gives us the routing matrix R, which tells us how related a certain patch is to each expert. By then taking the softmax of the router matrix, and we do this on the columns, we update the embeddings of each patch. And as a result, they are linear combinations of the input patches as we saw before. And let's go through this step by step. We start with the input X, the embeddings for each patch, and multiply that with the learnable matrix phi. This gives us the routing matrix R, which tells us how related a certain token is to a given expert. Taking the softmax of R on the columns and multiplying that with the input gives us a linear combination of patch inputs. These are routed to the best suited expert for a particular patch or soft patch input. Each expert processes these linear combinations of the patch embeddings to generate Y, the output. The output Y is multiplied with the softmax of R, but this time row-wise, creating a linear combination of expert outputs instead, which gives us the final output. This architecture, together with the router matrix, affects the input on a patch level and the output on an expert level. Since Transformers has found its way into the domain of vision, techniques like Mo are surprisingly transferable across domains. So keep in mind that whatever you learn about large language models might also have theoretical and practical implications to multimodal models. And that was it for this video. Thank you for keeping up thus far. If you're interested in more content like this, I have a newsletter where you will find very similar guides, a visual guide to quantization, for example, or Mamba, um, that might be of interest to you. I've also written a book together with Jay Allemar on this subject, which you can find on lmbook.com. And both of these have very visual, highly illustrative representations, images, things that you might enjoy. Thank you for watching.